So you may be wondering about today's sermon title, Three Chihuahuas and a Loaf of Bread. It's actually related to an image I came across in an NPR news article this week of three chihuahuas perched on the hood of a yellow cab in New York City. The image is undeniably an attention getter with the three cute pups, the iconic and instantly identifiable antique yellow cab, and a glimpse of a New York cityscape blurred into the background. It is also completely fake. Never happened. No chihuahuas, no cab, no cityscape, at least not all in the same time or the same place. The image is generated by an artificial intelligence computer program known as Doll E, a clever mashup of the names of the 2008 computer animated science fiction film Wall E and the Spanish surrealist painter Salvador Dali. The Doll E software is able to take a text prompt like three chihuahuas sitting on a yellow cab in New York City, search its 12 billion parameter neural network, locate the appropriate pieces and meld them together into a very real looking photograph that isn't really real at all. And my first thought for only a second was, wow, that is amazingly cool. Think of all the ways that capability could be used. My second thought a millisecond later was, wow, that is terrifying. Think of all the ways that capability could be misused. As in, give me a picture of my political opponent, insert name here, in a hotel room with three gangsters and a suitcase full of cash. Or, Give me a picture of soldiers in Ukrainian uniforms terrorizing Ukrainian citizens. Would we know if it was real? Would we not? What is real? Now a couple of caveats before you stay up all night on account of my sermon. The software DALI is in beta testing is not yet available to the general public, it may never be, and it currently is coded to ban depictions of real people. There are still ongoing discussions about what other sorts of guardrails need to be put in place, but that causes the quiet little voice in my head to say, locks are designed to keep the honest people out. So I don't know. Maybe guardrails only keep the honest people in line. Anyway, I read the reality-bending Dali article, went home that night, turned on the news, and there was fabulous, not fabulous, fabulous media personality Alex Jones sitting in a Texas courtroom and interacting with the parents of Sandy Hook shooting victims whom he has accused on the air of being crisis actors. The Sandy Hook shooting which killed 26 and 7-year-old children and 6 adults in 2012 never happened, Jones has said, or not as reported. The drama is fake, the grieving parents are paid actors, it's all a hoax created by the anti-gun lobby for political gain. If you tell a lie loudly enough and confidently enough, and often enough, then many will come to believe it's true. Many Americans, even today, exist in the fake reality that Jones and others have spawned. So again, the question, what is real and reliable? What is true? It isn't a new question. In my high school history class, we learned of yellow journalism which is journalism based upon sensationalism and exaggeration. One story involved William Randolph Hearst, editor of the New York Journal, 
and a proponent of U.S. intervention in the Cuban Revolution of 1895. Hearst sent illustrator Frederick Remington to cover the insurrection in Cuba. And legend has it that Remington cabled Hearst to say, there's no war to cover. And Hearst allegedly replied, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. As Abraham Lincoln once said, don't believe everything you read, especially on the internet. <laughs> this interplay of what is real and unreal, true and untrue, actual and questionable, even finds its place in Scripture. Think of the foundational story of the temptation of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. That's not true. This is true. That's not real. This is real. Or think of the Gospel of Luke. In the third chapter, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and a voice speaks from the heavens, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. But in the very next chapter, Jesus is alone in the wilderness, and the voice of temptation and doubt comes to him. If you are the Son of God, turn this stone to bread. If you are the Son of God, the kingdoms of the world are yours for the taking. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself from the temple and God will protect you. If, if if, chip, chip, chipping away at what Jesus knows to be true. Last example, and then I'll stop. 28th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Easter morning, story of the resurrection. The angel says to the witnesses, he's not here. He's been raised. Go quickly and tell his disciples, follow him to Galilee. And now we take up with the 11th verse. While they were going that fast, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, you must say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story is still told among the Judeans to this day. Now, why all of this conversation about talking snakes and photo fakes, about false headlines and inaccurate reports, about distortions, misrepresentations, willful misunderstandings, allegations, fears and falsehoods, and whispers of doubt. I simply want us to recognize that the world will at times, will oftentimes, seek to distort our truth This is true. We are beloved children of God. Each one of us created with delight as we are. 
We are created in the very image of God. We are loved. And we are lovable. And our faults and our failings are forgivable. And our needs are provided. And we are enough. And there is enough. And all that we are called to do is to love the God who created us and calls us with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. And then the world whispers this. God doesn't love you. What God? You aren't beloved. You're not even belovable. You're inadequate, deficient, not enough, never enough. Life isn't worth living. Your neighbor isn't worth loving. God helps those who help themselves, so help yourself. And then the world quotes Macbeth at us. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And there are three chihuahuas on the hood of that cab. Can't you see them? They're right there. And we're left to wonder what is really real. And we're left to doubt what is really true. Who we are, what we're called to, why are we here, what does it mean? I think this meal is a simple gift that restores reality. In our scripture lessons for this morning, Jesus said, I am the bread. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am real. I am true. I am nourishing and sustaining, right and righteous. And on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus sat at table with his disciples. And he took bread, representative of himself, and he broke it. He gave it to them. Gave it to all of them. The ones who argued among themselves who was the greatest. Doubting Thomas. Denying Peter. Betraying Judas. He gave it to all of them and he said to them, Do this in remembrance of me. This bread is self-giving love. Would I give myself to you in this way if you were unloved? If you were unworthy? If you were unforgivable? Would I give myself to you in this way if you didn't matter to God more than you could ever know? Would I give myself to you in this way if you were beyond help, beyond hope, beyond forgiveness, beyond restoration, transformation, or redemption? Would I give myself to you in this way? This is my body given for you. It's real. Remember, every time you touch, every time you taste, remember, remember me, remember you, remember real, remember true, remember. So if you've forgotten how loved you are, come to this table. 
If your self-image has ever been falsely twisted into self-loathing, come to this table. If anyone has ever caused you to doubt that you are enough just as you are, come to this table. If you're struggling, come to this table. If you're doing okay today, come to this table, receive bread for tomorrow. One of these images is a false reality construct, a fiction, and one is more real than we could ever know. Take, eat, love, share, hope, receive, forgive, ingest, digest, be strengthened. Remember, beloved. Amen.